we are um, in the week of the 30th anniversary of the pogrom in Rostock Lichtenhagen. And for several days there, the reception center for asylum seekers, the ZAST in Deutsch, uh, was attacked and the living place of the Vietnamese contract workers in the Sunflower House. The commemoration this year, in 30 years after this attack, is intended to focus on the perspective of those who were affected by this violence, to tell their stories, to shed light on the demands that result for them. For example, we listened to the radio play The Sunflower House from Dante Nguyen and he um, tells the story of the Vietnamese contract workers and their complex biography, uh, biography and uh, shows us that the pogrom is only one event in this complex biography. Uh, and so we yeah, get a broader understand, uh, uh, unders um, we, we understand this attacks and what happens better. But in this uh, discourse and in this story, there is a certain perspective missing. Uh, it is a perspective of those who had to live in the Zast, in the uh, reception center for asylum seekers. Um, and yeah, it is a good question, like why is this perspective missing? Why don't we hear, why don't we listen to this perspective? And there's a simple answer, because the people are missing in Germany. Uh, the political reacts to the attacks in the Sunflower House uh, was um, to have an agreement with Romania to take back the asylum seekers who had to live there during the attacks. So most of the affected people uh, in this uh, asylum seeker, in this reception center, uh, were just, yeah, were deported by the German state or were just leaving by themselves. So today, for the first time in Rostock, uh, we will listen to some stories of people who lived in the Tusk while it was attacked 30 years ago. We will listen to the story of Daniel Dumitru and his wife Shukarina Dumitru. We will listen to the story of Romeo Tiberiade. And we will uh, talk to Isabella Tiberiade. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, she is the daughter of Romeo uh, and a human rights activist in Malmö. And she came all the way from Malmö to Rostock to be with us. Today. Welcome, Isabella. Yeah, so today uh, we will see some videos of people who were affected by the attacks 30 years ago. Um, like we, we see this event as a starting point for the, um, yeah, for like, a, like a first step to get, to, know to, uh, to get to know each other and to listen to each other's perspective. Uh, Isabella said before that she wants uh, this event to be like an interactive event and that uh, she doesn't just not want to talk all the time to you but to uh, listen to your stories and to your views as well. So after um, we have a talk and after we watch the videos together of the interviews and um, there's going to be time to ask questions and to have statements um, as well. So, welcome Isabella. <laughs> How are you? How was your arrival here in Rostock? Thank you. Um, it was okay and I'm really glad and uh, I'm excited to uh, be here present and I'm sorry I don't speak German. When was the first time that you heard about these events, like the attacks of Osterbissen-Lichtenheim? Do you remember? As many young families that uh, returned back to um, Romania after the attacks, they they have received, um, they did not receive uh, help or support, and they they chose to be silent about this uh, topic. And I, I think it's understandable. Maybe it's a, it's a form of protection. So my parents never spoke about this uh, in an open discussion or in a, in a way that they wanted to um, teach us. But at some point, um, maybe when I was uh, um, 12 years old, uh, he started to talk uh, about this in a way that he realized how impactful it was and how uh, his life has changed because he's a he's an activist and he struggled so much for us to get educated 
So we are from a, a conservative uh, Roma community that it's been impacted uh, for years and generations by anti-Gypsyism, discrimination and oppression from the system. So when he understood this, he, he spoke to us and my brother was uh, born here. Um, and uh, that uh, was one of the trigger how he started to tell us the story. And I think sometimes when there were some movies uh, with uh, heroes, he and my mom were telling um, how heroic they were to escape the, the fires and as well the other uh, fellow um, Roma. That was the, the narrative. But then I grew up and I, 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 I made my own research and then I made my own questions for him. So your parents were living in the like um, reception of asylum seekers in the Sunflower House where when they were attacked and um, and after they went back to Romania and, and, so, and no, uh, yeah like two of your siblings were already uh, there with them in the um, in the Sunflower House yes and then they traveled back afterwards to Romania yes they traveled after uh, three months. Uh, back to Romania because after the attacks they had been relocated to a different uh, um, they referred to this settlement as camp but it was a, was a pension um, but they left because the attacks uh, never stopped and they decided it's better to be in Romania and they created a, a life there they continued uh, their struggles uh, with uh, the system this oppressive system but uh, step by step they managed to create a safe space for their family and now we are six uh, siblings in total. Yeah. And can you um, tell us something about what you do now and uh, how you got the ideas to yeah, make these videos we are watching later? Um, yes, so after I, um, after I graduated university and uh, I, I graduated human rights and I think it it speaks for itself because um, I have uh, I have seen how my my parents uh, um, faced this um, treatment from from Romania and still we have remained there we uh, we haven't um, uh, chosen another country um, I I'm active in in this field and I think uh, it's mainly thanks to my father. He's also uh, very active, and we together have uh, researched and interviewed uh, uh, survivors from the Holocaust, from uh, the genocide, because there were deportations from Romania, and it all started like this, and then we linked to this event as well, because um, it was quite recent, there were 50 years apart, and um, my, my, my father um, and me, I think we have a more special case because uh, we wanted to um, work for, for our rights and I could say that uh, this videos only it's a small part that could show the effects of the, of the program and of the attacks and uh, the fact that they returned and nothing changed, uh, it's, it means that we still have uh, things to do and we still, we feel like it's a responsibility we have because we, um, we managed to have an education so that we can protect our own uh, people. And the idea, to answer more precisely, um, the idea came first because it, it was an, an, for the first time in 30 years that some entity and institution were, was showing interest for, for, this, uh, for us and for Roma, how they experienced the, um, the attacks and because it was, it was part of our uh, long-term uh, project to uh, create a different narrative uh, from, from us. Um, how how did you choose who to interview? Like, was it difficult to find people to uh, who wanted to speak in front of the camera? Honestly, it was very difficult because <laughs> there are a lot of them, uh, and uh, I'm in close contact with them. They are mostly my relatives, 
but they were so scared to talk about this because they, um, I think most of them, they don't remember because nobody has ever shown interest and they would just say, yes, we went there and uh, these attacks happened which destroyed our plan to get a better life because we ran away from Romania. It was hard to, to find people to interview. Um, I think they, most of them, because they are uh, still affected, they, they, they still have these uh, memories. But choosing this, um, it, it was not choosing, but I had more discussions and uh, the people you're going to hear, they, they just show a little part of how they experienced uh, their travel to Germany and so on. And after taking the interview with them, the press showed more interest and that's, you know, more stories unfolded. And it was so interesting for myself as well to uh, discover that there's so much more to, to be uh, presented. But it, it takes time. They, they are not so ready for, for that, so, yeah. Okay, uh, maybe we should start um, to take a look. Uh, we talk about the interviews and now we're gonna uh, watch the first uh, interview uh, with uh, Daniel Dumitru. Um, maybe you can uh, yeah, just explain, have a, explain to us who, who is he and how did you meet him? Daniel is a very nice friend. Uh, he was very helpful and he brought his uh, wife as well to interview. I also spoke to his kids. Uh, of children, they are older than me. <laughs> um, he is uh, working in uh, the Roma market we have in Romania. He's a very good seller, and he's. Um, I think he. You're gonna. If you're gonna enjoy listening to to him. Okay, we will. Hai, când am venit acum, care e 
there was no interest from Romanians and I I feel really indebted, you know, to um, contribute to a change, to an impact. There are some Roman families who stayed in Germany um, after, um, like, like um, in, in the nineties. Are there like connections uh, between uh, between them? Like, um, do they have contact to people who stayed in, in Germany? Is there, is there like um, information exchange? To be very, to be very honest, we, I don't know about families from my regions that stayed in Germany. That I don't know. But I could have found out because we are a, a very compact community and we know each other and that's how we stayed alive because we have this very strong connection. But um, when Roma Romanians arrived in Germany, it was uh, there were particular cases depending on the geographic point of Romania. Um, the people from my region, uh, which is the south, have a different um, uh, trajectory and a, a different uh, when they came back had a different um, idea first of all to go back but I think because of the attacks of the in Rostock but I think that if they would have um, um, stayed in contact with other families I I don't think it would have um, contributed to anything because probably the families who remained here they are isolated completely from the Roma community because they must have discovered that that is the only way to have a, a better state. I, I think I, I, I tried to answer clearly as I understand because I don't have this information but for my region there is no family who stayed in Germany. Yeah, I'm just asking because I I thought I um, read it in one of the transcripts of the interview that they had a contact, but I might um, uh, got that wrong. Um, and I I think what um, is important to point out is that the Roma who uh, left they left at uh, different times after the attacks across let's say three months because they wanted to stay actually because they saw um, they saw that. They relocated them and it was better or safer, but the attacks didn't stop. So they, they left in different times, like different period. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, before I um, say some things that are uh, wrong about the transcripts, um, no, no. let's uh, just listen to the, um, or let's uh, watch the next uh, interview, which is um, very interesting as well, because it's a, a wife of Adanya. Uh, Shukrina, um, is here here? Can you uh, tell us something about her too? Yes, uh, Shukarina means the pretty one in my language in Romanes. And um, you like I I don't want to spoil the interview, but she was very reluctant to talk. And the more you speak to her, the more you understand that she has so much to say, and she has a totally different perspective. Uh, than from a man and there's also one thing um, that I really find it interesting is how um, how connected they feel with this uh, e event even though they don't talk about it and you can see you can see this from from her perspective and how scared they are to give full answers because they they have this conception that is a is an interview and, Probably they say something wrong and something happens to them again. So. 